Hi. Hey, thank you. Hello, all, and welcome to today's webinar, How to Combine uh, Front-End and Back-End Testing with Sid Naron, a sales engineer from BlazeMeter, and we have Dominique Lucia from Soft Labs, who's one of our solution specialists. Sid and Dom are going to showcase how you can ensure your apps will handle holiday loads with JMeter and Selenium today. This is a practical how-to webinar in which we'll show you how to get real-world results from your front end while applying back end, uh, load testing to the back end. Uh, my name is Ken Drachnik, and I'll be moderating today's session. Uh, the Q&A panel in the lower right-hand side is probably the best place to submit questions during this event. I know a lot of people have questions, so we'll answer questions as they come in uh, during the webinar, and we'll save the last 10 or 15 minutes of the event uh, to answer Q&A. So make sure you stick around for, uh, for that so you can get all the information you can out of today's webinar. Due to privacy concerns, you won't see anyone in the attendees panel, but you can rest assured we'll have hundreds of folks attending today's event. Uh, many of folks sign up for the event uh, from different time zones who are unable to make it live. So we'll be sending out a recording and slides uh, after the event, so please be sure to share these freely with all of your, your colleagues. All right, let's get started, and I'll turn it over to you, to you Dom. Thank you much, Ken. I appreciate everyone's time, and I'm pretty excited about kind of showing off what it's like to do some a little bit of functional testing, and um, my friend Sid is going to handle the back-end testing uh, right after that. So. Um, I am a solution engineer here at Sauce Labs, and I come from a QA background, so that is where I'm coming from. Um, when it comes to functional testing, you know, I want to be able to tell tell you all exactly, you know, what is functional front end testing? Um, how do we get it done? What are the important things about front end testing? So, three things, the high level things you need to know about functional testing are really First of all, think of your users. Um, the people who are going to be using your app, whether they're internal to your company, uh, external users that you know pay money or um, bring in revenue somehow for your application, you know, these are all the people that are going to be using it. They should be the focus of your testing, and you should always make sure to have them in mind when you're doing functional front-end testing. The second thing is that when you go to scale, you need to think about how to do that with quality automation. So if you're testing everything you know, by yourself in a room, um, it's going to take a really long time and it's going to slow the pace of development down. So you need to be able to test more and as the project grows, you need, you need to be able to test all those things faster. Um, getting quality feedback from reliable tests is imperative to driving the speed of your project. And the last thing is you need to test everything. So making sure that the UI is easy to navigate or things don't crash is important for a user, but when you go to scale out to serve many, many users, you need to make sure that the back end can handle it too. So why functional testing? Uh, why is it important? Is it product quality, user experience? You know, these are things we kind of add around. Um, a lot of people talk about UX and, you know, I want, I want to make a beautiful app. I want people to love my app. Um, but let's start a little bit simpler. How about just avoiding embarrassment? So, you know, throughout the years, there's been some, some pretty high visibility, uh, very embarrassing times for various companies. Um, Apple has had two instances where alarms have failed to go off for many, many, many people, and it's, it's caused a lot of bad press. Uh, there's the famous Apple Maps where you can see the, the source and destination don't really get connected by any of those three routes. Um, you know, testing is something that should have revealed something like that. And, of course, the, the famous keynote where Bill Gates was unveiling the brand-new cutting-edge Windows 98, and he unveiled it to the world with a blue screen of death. So... We do functional testing really to make sure that stuff works. So how do we functionally test? And I functionally test things every time I get a new device or a piece of software. I open menus, I click around in the UI, and I, I exercise features. And functional testing really is just an organized way of exercising the app. And as we say at FOSS Labs, you want to make sure that you test all the things, right? So here we have a tester, and she's interacting with the app. 
and menus. She's going through different various, various aspects of the UI. And this gets a little tiring after a while because you're constantly, you know, everything, some, every time something changes, you need to go back and retest it to make sure it works. So what if we get a robot to do it for us, right? If we can write a program or a script to test it for us, then we can effectively test in our sleep. And not only can we test in our sleep, but we can actually scale ourselves, right? So you can clone yourself, and you can test different parts of your application in different scenarios. Um, for example, after a time change that caused one of the two Apple alarm clock bugs, um, you, know, you get more coverage by using automation. You have this little robot army that goes and tests these different features. And don't forget to test in Windows and Mac OS, various browsers and, and OSs that your customers might use. And of course, then you have multiple browsers for each of those OSs. So you can see that your test matrix starts to grow pretty substantially uh, as you start to think about your users. So why not just keep scaling that out and keep running everything in parallel so that everything can get tested very, very quickly? Now look, a whole little army of clone robot men that are doing all your bidding and you're still sleeping and getting, getting creatures tested all in parallel, all very, very quickly. And all your little robots are controlled by a test framework language that we call Selenium. And the reason why all of this scale and parallelization is important is because although a lot of companies, and this was absolutely my experience in QA, start out at waterfall or fast waterfall, when you start to release more often than the traditional waterfall, mo waterfall model, which is uh, maybe releasing a major version a couple of times a year, you know, subversions and point releases uh, a little bit more often, when you start to go to continuous integration, and to continuous delivery, you're constantly testing. And you need to be able to, to merge code and test code and get that feedback back to developers instantaneously so that you can then release features and bug fixes very, very quickly to respond to market demands and user demands. So how does Sauce fit into this? Well, Sauce basically provides that robot army and a place for them to work. So what you do is, you have your Selenium scripts, all those nice scripts that you've written to control your robot army. And Sauce Labs provides a very clean, a very secure environment for those robots to work in. We can provide as many robots as you want. And the great thing about Sauce Labs is that we actually provide the cleanest, what I like to call a clean room environment, where every time you spin up another robot, he's actually working in a brand new instance of that browser so that what the previous robots have done before him won't kind of mess up his tests and, and interfere with his work. There's nothing left over because every time we start a new test, we actually create a brand new VM and robot. And every time the, the robot finishes, well, we destroy the VM and we don't really tell the robot what happens at the end of the test. And of course, Cross-browser testing is a huge focus here at Sauce Labs. So we want you to be able to test all of your app in all of its different parts on all these different browsers, OSs, and mobile devices, both emulated and virtual mobile devices, as well as real devices, all at the same time. And when you start to test all the different parts of your app all at the same time, all in these different browsers and OSs, and you've got that giant robot army cooking for you, everything is really, really efficient and gets you results very quickly. What Sauce Labs does at the end of the test is it packages up all those results. It's got screenshots. The results include a lot of log files so that you know exactly where to look to see what went wrong if anything did go wrong. So with that, I'm going to show you how it actually works. So this is actually a, an old joint venture between Sauce Labs and BlazeMeter, where it's a very, very simple uh, test app, basically, where you choose your departure and destination city. And once you've done that, you click on Find Flights. It brings up your list of flights, and you can continue on. 
something that we really stress at Sauce Labs is making your tests as small or what we call atomic and as autonomous, which means they don't rely on any other tests. So the sample test that I'm going to do is just going to come to this first page and pull up a, a flight list from Paris to Buenos Aires. And it's going to make sure that Paris is under the depart column. So it's a very, very simple test. Um, we're going to show a few other tests that test a couple of other different things, and we're going to launch all those tests all at the same time. So look at all my little robots churning away. The counter on the side is going to show us our concurrent session. So look, I've got 64 robots that are doing my bidding, all testing various parts of my application, and we're being tested under Mac OS, uh, Firefox, Chrome, Windows, under Firefox, Chrome, and Internet Explorer, and Edge. All these different things are being tested all simultaneously. And we can actually go in and watch a test as it's in process. Once the test completes, it will go forward and it will report that it's been successfully completed. And then I can check back here and show all of my passing. And if I have any, oh, looks like I have a failed test here. So first I'm going to show you an example of a test that's actually passed. So let's see here. We'll go ahead and look at a test on OS X 10.10 .10 on the latest version of Firefox. Something that's very nice, as I mentioned, there's um, a lot of great what we call test assets from Sauce Labs that we give you, which is all of the things that happen during your test. Uh, there's various log files here that show you everything you could possibly want to know, or what was happening when the test was running. Um, but we also give you screenshots and, again, the ability to watch that whole playback of the entire test. So here you can see that right before the test passed, we actually can visually verify. Now, I did this already with the actual code because we wouldn't want to have to go in and look at all of those 64 test cases to make sure that this indeed says you know, Paris or Philadelphia. But um, the actual code here verified it, but now we can also verify it visually. And every step of the way, we actually have a screenshot that's taken. So it's almost like a frame-by-frame -frame playback of your test, which is really nice whenever you're trying to figure out, okay, where exactly did things go wrong? Maybe it didn't go wrong at the very end. Maybe something happened partway through the test that actually derailed things and threw off my app. I'm going to go back here. And there's a couple of failures. Let's see. So now it's pulling up from our secure storage. It's pulling up those test assets. reason here, we can see that the test didn't actually proceed past this first, uh, this first screen here. So something about this version of Safari, uh, which is Safari 7 in OS 10, 10.9, and I can't remember which uh, CAD or California landmark that is, but in OS X 10.9 in Safari 7, something about our app isn't actually working. So we know that something's broken, and now we can go back to our developers and say, hey, something about the code is, is broken for this browser OS combination. And if that's something that product management wants to you know, take under advisement and, you know, okay, with, that's an acceptable risk, or is it something that we need to really dig into the code and look at, um, that is something that you can make a decision, an informed decision about right at that time. So it's very simple, and this is obviously a very simple, small uh, snippet of what you can actually do, but 
when you start to scale this out to larger and, and wider tests and more browser OS combinations, um, it's a very, very powerful tool. So with that, I think that's a great intro to front-end testing. And I am going to toss it over to Sid for uh, how to cover back-end testing. Hey, hey, Dominic, there's a question uh, online on uh, the button above that says create JIRA issue. Could you maybe explain what that does? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so this is a really cool piece of design, and I'm pretty proud of actually our dev teams do a really great job of getting, you know, think about your users and think about how you're going to use this and how are things going to be best implemented. Um, once I see that this test has failed, we can actually create a JIRA issue right here in line in the Sauce Labs dashboard. So if your environment is using a JIRA ticketing system from Atlassian, you can actually select, hey, um, you know, our, now these are actually the Sauce Labs internal uh, projects, so I won't actually file an issue here, but uh, we can say 10.9 Safari 7. We can also attach the Selenium logs the video playback, and the current screenshots so that the developer can, can see really, really quickly, hey, this is exactly what was going on, and this is exactly where I need to start my search as far as looking for what caused that issue. Is there anything else there, Ken? Uh, there are a lot of mechanical kinds of questions. Uh, uh, I, here's one that I thought was kind of interesting. Is I'm curious about the test naming convention and the trick that is used to have the browser version information of the test name. Uh, do you have any insights on naming tests, I guess? So if we take a look at my code, um, the test name here is actually just the, the function name in my code. And then the actual naming of the test is automatically done by Sauce Labs. Does that answer the question? I actually can. Yeah, uh, I think that's, a, that's, that's, that's great. great. I think that's you can't fantastic. Out the, the chat's coming in, so um, yeah, you're going to have to go ahead and, and keep narrating those to me. No, that's fantastic. Why don't you uh, turn it over to Sid and let's uh, see what uh, talk about Blaze Meter. Awesome. Yeah. So now that we we've, we've shown, you know, can our website work or or fall down, or you know, where does it where does it work? We have got to make sure that it's going to work quickly for all of our customers when they start hammering it at travel time. Perfect. Uh, thanks, Dominic, for that awesome presentation. Uh, let me just quickly share my screen here. Okay, perfect. So uh, thanks, everyone, for joining us today. Uh, as Ken had introduced in the starting, my name is Sid Rang. I am a sales engineer out of Brave Meter's headquarter office, which is in Palo Alto, California. The purpose of my section today is really going to refresh those of you who are already are familiar with performance testing. And if you're not, this is, will be an introduction to performance testing and answer any questions you might have about getting started. So whether you're a seasoned QA specialist or a developer just getting started, you'll learn something about Blaze Meter and performance testing and how it, how it can help you with your day-to-day -day job. One of the things we're seeing here at Blaze Meter is that there's a whole new era of performance testing. A lot of people are recognizing there's a huge need for high performance applications. And performance testing, as same with functional testing as well, has risen in prominence again as we enter continuous integration and continuous delivery. Okay, so just a quick little history. I like to just give you a, a level set of what Blaze Meter's about. We're about five years old, we have 100,000 a users. This might actually be higher, um, just estimated that. And we have ran multiple performance tests, you know, up to millions, probably more than that as well. And we're distributed around the globe as well. So we have offices in San Francisco and Tel Aviv as well. So really why performance tests, right? I'm sure this is why you guys are here uh, for me to help you answer that question. So with this session today, Hopefully that answer becomes a lot clearer and the need becomes clearer as well. One of the main reasons we see is that applications and user experiences 
are getting closer than ever before. There's, there's a big need for higher performing applications. So the point of performance and functional testing has become a big need in terms of user experiences. What we do at BlazeMeter is that we take an open source and DevOps native approach to doing performance testing. So what I mean by that is, uh, if you're using tools such as JMeter, Gatling, Grindr, uh, all those open source tools, what we do is we help allow you to scale those tools in an enterprise-grade platform. And I'll cover specifically how we do that and what we can do with those tools. We're taking an enterprise uh, open source uh, view here so that you're not stuck with proprietary languages when you are run it, trying to run a performance test. So BlazeMeter itself is 100% compatible with multiple open source tools. We'll show you how you can actually extend on those open source tools as well, how you can uh, run automated performance tests on your applications, on your web mobile, web apps, and, and much, much more, right? And the end user experience, right? The, the end goal here is that the user experience, user experience is extremely important and this is why performance and functional testing has become clearly a big part of that interaction. So if, you, if there's three things that you guys can all take away from the performance testing part of it, uh, I'll cover them right now. One is understanding the bottlenecks and the saturation points of your application. So we have many customers that are, uh, for the first time, they're running some sort of performance test against their app, their mobile app, and it's extremely important, especially when you're capacity planning, to figure out where the bottlenecks appear, right? So when I actually show you a demo today, you'll see clearly what is the amount of load that my application can handle and what happens when I do put a lot of load on that application. What exactly occurs? You will see that in real time with the demo today. The next is quality automation. So Dom had covered this as well, is when you are automating a performance test, functional test, it's really important to get the feedback that you need going forward because if you're just automating, right, you're not going to be able to, uh, and if you're not taking information from that automation, you're not going to be able to make the changes you need. So what we mean by quality automation is automate your performance and functional tests, but also get the feedback you need to uh, make changes and, and deliver the right applications, right? And obviously it wouldn't be a combination webinar if we weren't just testing for performance. Definitely test the functional side as well because, again, we're trying to get the biggest picture here. We're trying to see how the app, mobile app, how they perform, not only in terms of the front end, but also in terms of the performance side as well, the back end side. So just a quick little introduction of what performance testing is. I won't go into too much detail, but the idea here is that uh, we're simulating clients, right? So the clients here, what they're doing is that they're using a simple request, and it might be a complicated request specific to your scenario, but what we're doing here is we're sending one simulated client, we're telling them to hit this specific request, and it's hitting the back end of that server. Now, the whole idea behind performance testing is that obviously you know, we can't get a bunch of, you know, 100 people in the room, they're all going to hit this specific request. We need to be able to simulate these clients, right? We need to be able to hit 100,000, 1 million users if we want to, right? And that's not really realistic if you actually do it manually. And this is where performance testing really comes into play, where we can help simulate those clients so that they can hit the back end of your servers. Okay. Uh, when you are running a performance test, there are key performance indicators you're looking for. So what I mean by that is, look, you're going to run a performance test. You're looking for some sort of concurrency, right, which is the amount of load that you're putting on the application. And then you want to take a look at what's happening within the application itself. All right, so I'll cover this during the demo today, but there are some key performance indicators that we like to look at. Uh, for an example, the throughput, right, how much activity is actually going on with my concurrency. I actually ran, this is probably one of our biggest tests we ran. This is 1.2 million users that we ran, uh, and we can scale up to a much higher load if you needed to. We have the ability to do that. The other key performance indicators that are extremely important are errors, right? You're definitely going to get some sort of errors when you're stressing the application. So we'll dig deeper within the demo and show you what happens and how you can debug from there. And this is probably the most important KPI out there is the response time. What we're looking for is how is the app responding when load is increasing, right? So we will show you all those trends today during the demo and how you can dig a little bit deeper and really start to 
have a better understanding of your application. Uh, I just wanted to put this out there. Uh, JMeter itself is one of the most popular performance testing tools. The good thing is it's open source. So if anyone here is using JMeter, and even if they're not using JMeter, if you guys have Locust, Gatling, Grinder scripts, all of these work at the protocol layer. Uh, so what that means is they allow you to simulate the client requests, right? So if you wanted to scale that up, what you can then, then do is then use Blade Meter, which is 100% compatible with these open source tools so that you can get a realistic performance test. Right, so just kind of wanted to point that out. We always bring out JMeter because it's, it's a cross-platform. It's, it's, it's available on all the platforms out there. And the good thing is it's open source as well. Okay. Uh, what we see in this industry, there's always some sort of recorder. It's a good to have to record a test plan. Right? So if you do not want to use a recorder, that's totally fine. You can create the scripts in JMeter, Gatling, Grinder, Locust. That's perfectly fine with us. If you just need some sort of help in getting started, especially if you're new to performance testing, we do have multiple recorders that can help you with that. So the first one that I like to, and this is what I'll show during the demo today, is we have actually a web recorder. So if you guys saw Dom's application, which was that simple travel agency, I'll go through that as well, and I'll show you how you can actually record that scenario and run a performance test against that scenario itself. Now, obviously, with mobile devices out there, mobile apps, uh, very relevant to the whole user experience, we do have a mobile recorder as well. So you can actually record native app actions and requests so you can simulate what a user would do within the mobile device itself, and then you can use Blaze Meter to scale that up. But today, we'll be focusing on the web recorder, and I'll actually just do that in, in just a quick minute here. Um, just to give you an introduction again of Blaze Meter, we'll take your open source scripts, we'll, uh, we'll couple it with enterprise features, you'll have features out there that JMeter doesn't have or Locust, Gatlink, Grindr don't have. Integrate it with tools, you know, we can integrate it with your CI and CD frameworks, we can integrate it with APM tools as well. Provide you with the real-time reporting, right? And this is probably the most important part of it, is when you do run a performance test or any sort of test, you need to be able to analyze what happened, right? And if you are able to analyze that in real time, that's even better. And we can show that to you during the demo. Again, I keep saying during the demo, but we will get to that very quickly. Okay. Um, just a quick architecture slide. Um, the reason I like to bring this up is that when you do run a performance test, you're looking to distribute that test from multiple locations. So we can definitely offer that. Um, you know, if you have clients and web applications that are based throughout the world, we can definitely help you performance test that, right? So it gives you a realistic performance test. Now, one other thing that we see often is you might have apps, pre-production apps that are behind the firewall, right? So these do not have access to the cloud. Uh, they don't have access to any public sites, really. They're just internal. They're behind the firewall. Don't worry, we can fully support those. We do have the ability to support internal apps. Uh, we actually have a hybrid model for that specific term. So the user experience doesn't change, but you do have the ability to test behind that firewall. So what I'll be doing today, uh, this is just a pre-demo slide. I'll create the scenario. I'll go through that example site that we have. I'll kind of record every single step from that scenario itself. Define some load parameters, how many concurrent users I'd like, you know, how long I want the test to run for, run the test as well, real time, uh, and I can show you an example of a test that's already done, and analyze the results. Okay, so I'll quickly just go into the demo here. Now, this is the same exact site that Dom ran a functional, multiple functional tests against. So what we're going to do here today is we're going to run a performance test against this app. Now, the Chrome recorder that I keep talking about is built for the Chrome browser. So if you guys want to find it, just go to the Chrome store, search for Blaze Meter, and you'll be able to see that this recorder itself. How it works, it's pretty simple. All you have to do is you just have to basically, and I'll just give it a random number, you just start recording. So what that means is, just like our user would, you can go to the home page, right? So I'm in the home page now. I can pick a specific flight that I want to travel from. So let's say I'm, I'm in Boston and I want to go to New York. I can go ahead and find that flight, choose that flight as well, and I can fill out some information. Right, so if you guys saw, we are going through multiple requests. Some were get, some were post. 
So we do have a combination of requests here. What you can do is you can go back into this recorder itself and stop the recording, and I'll show you just how this recording looks like. Right, so there's a couple of requests that were recorded. There's a home page, which was a get request. There's a post request as well when we actually reserve the fight. Right, so when we reserve the fight, if you had noticed, we took in values from two cities. So what the recorder is doing is it's actually taking that value as well. So this itself is a great way to get a structure of a script. Now, if you wanted to make more changes to it, if you wanted to apply logic, this itself can actually be exported to a JMeter script, so you can do all of that scripting and dynamic changes within JMeter itself. Okay, so I'll quickly just export this JMX. Everything looks fine. Uh, there are four requests here. And what I can do now is I can go into BrazeMeter. Okay. Uh, before I actually show you kind of the creation of a test, I like to just show you the reporting first. Uh, this is always just a, a much better uh, visualization going forward where you can see what happened in terms of performance test. Right, so I ran this test. Um, it had about 450 users. We had important KPIs here such as throughput. We did have some errors as well, so I can take a look at that and figure out what the errors are. And then one of these KPIs, which is clearly standing out, is the response time. Right? Why in the world is my application taking 17 seconds to respond? That is, a, you know, that's one of the, that's not a good number to have, and especially if this was a revenue generating site, which some of you guys were probably testing. If a user is taking 16, 17 seconds to walk through a purchase, they're probably not going to finish that purchase. Right, so this is a good way of figuring out where the bottlenecks are. Um, just in terms of the summary, right, we haven't even drilled deeper into the test itself, but already I know that I cannot handle 450 users against that site that I recorded. If you wanted to dig a little bit, dig a little bit deeper, we do allow you to do that. So I always like to show you this common report. And what this report allows you to do is it allows you to correlate KPIs against each other. Right? So you always are looking for relationships. You're looking for some sort of combination of KPIs here. And what we do is we have a simple way of selecting these KPIs. Where let's say I didn't want to see the hits. I don't, let's say I don't care about the errors as well. I just care about the concurrency and the response time. I've selected those KPIs, right? So I have those already plotted out. And already you can start seeing really where the concurrency goes up, how the response time reacts to it. Right? So if you see in the initial starting phases, when we're scaling up to 115, 120 users, response time is okay under two seconds, which is, which is an okay response time. But what happens is my bottleneck of my application starts to appear, right? If I did have 150, 160, we're taking 5, 7, 10, 15 seconds sometimes for the application to respond. So just from the get-go, you have the ability here to really figure out where is the maximum capacity of your application itself. As you can see here, it's about 130 users because after that, that user experience really drops and you know, this could be revenue. Uh, this could be a loss of revenue, or just a bad user experience going forward. Now, if you're like me, I like to look at hard numbers. It's great to visualize it, but sometimes I just want to see what's happening within the application in terms of the specific requests. So, if you have you know five to ten specific requests within your scenario, sometimes you want to drill down and figure out what within that scenario was slowing the whole application down, right? That is a pretty common use case because a user journey doesn't involve the same exact request and the same exact response times. There are differences here. So what we do is we tell you what the differences are. And you can see we pretty much take all your uh, labels from your script. This could be your JMeter script, Locus, Gatling, Grinder. This is your scenario, and we're filtering that scenario by that specific statistics. Right? So for an example, I like to just point this out. I had a confirmation page mark in my request, in my scenario, and that took about 20 seconds, right? which is awful again, but the average is awful as well. Right? So this is a way to drill a little bit deeper and figure out what within your performance testing scenario was slowing the whole application down, whole user journey down. Right? Because you don't want to just test one specific endpoint. You might want to test out a whole journey going forward. Just to kind of uh, give you 
there's a question here uh, in terms of those numbers, and I think people are really interested in kind of what are what are good benchmark numbers for those, for like average response time and things like that. What, what do you recommend that people uh, aim for? Sure. No, that, that's a that's a really good question. In terms of, I think this question can even come back to you in terms of what type of user experience do you want your users to have? Right? If you want them waiting 10 seconds, and this is specific to a user journey, sometimes you might want to be testing a web service call or API, which those you can, you'll have a much lower number. But I would say, I mean, there's no real number out there. It's more of an industry standard where if your user is waiting three to four seconds between a request, they are more likely to not continue that journey. And if, again, I always like to point it to the revenue generating because if this is an e-commerce site or something that's making you money, and if a user is not going through with that journey, they're definitely not going to, you know, give you guys money. Um, so I would say, you know, the numbers that I've seen, is it keeps getting lower. Just know that the response time number needs to be as low as possible. But I would see about two to three seconds. And if anything more than that, you know, you might be uh, losing out on, on a couple of things. Okay. Does that, does that answer your question? Terrific. That's great. Thanks. Perfect. So one thing we like to do is you're going to run a performance test. You're going to get errors, right? You're definitely, and if you're not getting errors, great for you. That means the application is okay, but I'd recommend testing at a higher level where you can figure out what the errors are. So I see about three and a half percent errors, right? What I can do here is I can go down, figure out what the errors really are. And the best way to do it is just go in the response code. And for an example, I have this, non-HTTP response code exception, which is a socket exception. If I had no idea what that meant, that's not a problem. We actually tell you what that message means, which is actually means that the connection reset. This means that there's too much load on that application. And that happened about 472 times within my performance scenario. Right, so this is a good way of figuring out what your errors were. And uh, it's always going to happen when you do run a performance test. Even if you get one error, that's going to give you a better way to, de uh, to debug and figure out what's wrong with the application. What we do is we go one step beyond that, right? So you saw the errors here. You're, you're seeing a good idea of what the errors mean. And hey, look, it happens about 470 times. But maybe the question is, when does the error actually occur, right? Because that's also important to understand is while users are going up, while you're running a performance test, what's happening within the errors, right? When are the errors coming? So we actually do a lot of development within the timeline report as an organization, and we're seeing that um, if you wanted to see the response code, let's say you wanted to see the socket exception, you can actually plot that error out, and you can see when during a performance testing scenario did you get your first error. And that happened specifically at about 317 users, and you can see that from then on out, it keep on getting these errors. Right, so just a good way of debugging it where you can see you have errors, you can figure out what the errors actually are, and the best thing is you can plot those errors as well and figure out when they occurred. Just moving on in terms of, sorry, was there a question? Hey, Sid, yeah, there's another question here. Uh, if you go back to that uh, numbers report where you had the numbers of throughput and things like that, uh, some people have sure. some questions about uh, about those. Like, if you could go across those top numbers and maybe explain the definitions of uh, average throughput, uh, errors, uh, ninety percent response, things like that. Sure. Yeah, we can do that. Uh, so, for max users, that's the total. That's not the total, but that's at the concurrency at my highest peak. So, I had about four hundred fifty users, and I had set this up within the test configuration. Uh, throughput is the amount of hits we're getting. Uh, the amount of activity these users are actually doing within the application. So 20 is about a very low type of throughput. That means that even if I have 450 users, they're not doing too much because as you saw during the, during the um, example application I had, there's not much to do, right? There's about two or three clicks. Errors, these are all the errors that your server is throwing back into you, uh, back to you. So response codes, um, response messages, Response time, just the amount of time it takes for the server, for the request to be sent out to the server, and you getting that request back, the response code back. So that's kind of the response code, uh, response time. The 90th percentile, 
We actually have more, uh, more stats here. We can give you the 95th, 99th as well. But this just means that 10% of my response times were actually higher than 38 seconds, while 90% were below 38. Uh, and just the bandwidth, that's the amount of, again, bandwidth that was generated with the scenario. 400 kilobytes is pretty small, but this is if you have a very intensive bandwidth scenario, this would help with that. Last thing before I kind of just... Yeah, no worries, Ken. Last thing before I just conclude it, I, this is kind of the quality automation part of it. So let's say I automated this performance test. You can run this through CI, through CD processes. What we can actually do is we can have a big picture overview of the historical data of how this performance test performed. Right? So I've been running this test. Uh, let's say I ran this through CI, through Jenkins. Right? So I'm automating my performance test. I might not be taking a look at it every single time. But what we're doing is we're giving you the historical view of how this performance test is responding, how the error percentage is looking like, and there's also some other KPIs on here as well. So this is just a good way of figuring out what the real, uh, the big picture looks like. Right? And if you want to, we have other ways of com comparing reports as well. You can drill down into a specific test, and from there on out, you can get the information you need. Okay, so that kind of wraps up the demo portion of it. Uh, just to kind of conclude what we've talked about. So again, the three things within performance testing, understand the bottlenecks, as you saw within my application, the same one that Dom worked on, we can only handle around 140 users because after that, the saturation has already been hit. Automation, it's great to have, you know, and we can talk about this at a later session that we will be having as well. We'll actually have a part two webinar on how we can get to automation and really start getting the feedback we need. And obviously, not just test the performance side, but also test the front end and the functional side as well. Okay, so this will be more of the second series that we'll be having, uh, which will be focused on automating. I just kind of wanted to bring it up that we do automate from any CI or CD. So you can actually just, for example, I like to use Jenkins. You can set up your Jenkins shop just like you're running for your bills and start automating your performance as going forward. And this itself allows you to do this. It allows you to shift left, right? So many of you might be testing in production, which is totally fine. That's how the industry has been doing it, right? We have an application, we've built it out, and let's run a performance test, right? But why not start performance testing at an earlier time when you're developing new code and then releasing those, uh, deploying every deployment? So this is the idea here is using this open source framework is that you can start performance testing at an earlier stage. Just a quick next step, you can create an account if you like. Uh, we do give a free account that can run up to 50 users. Check out our performance testing blog. We do have a lot of information relevant to just the industry and performance testing itself. If you want to using BlazeMeter, and if you have questions with that, check out the BlazeMeter knowledge base. It just has everything relevant to the application itself. If you guys are using social media, uh, definitely check us out at Twitter, at BlazeMeter. So I think uh, we'll kind of move to the Q&A part of it. Uh, and Ken, I will pass those right in for you. Great. Hey, so that, that was a wonderful uh, demo, guys. Uh, a couple of questions came up. One was about the integrations between uh, Sauce Labs and BlazeMeter. And my understanding is that this time we don't have a formal integration. But what you can do is kick off tests uh, using your CI server and have those kick off functional tests and then kick off uh, load tests. Can, can you maybe talk about that? Uh, sure, I, I can answer that unless Dom you want to answer it, answer it as well. But Ken, yeah, you had it pretty much on point here. We don't have a formal integration, but the way we can integrate together is through the CI and CD frameworks itself. So what you can do is you can set up your CI tool to run a performance and functional test at the same time. That way you're able to get the information and feedback you need. So we don't have a formal integration, and I'm sure that's something that we will be working on very closely at but that's probably the best way forward is to run it as a combination of the two. And, and how often do you recommend doing these tests? I mean, do you have opportunities to do testing and you know, both functional testing and load testing at, at dev, at pre-production, at pre-deployment, at deployment, and once it's in production? Uh, do you recommend that people do these tests kind of at all those stages, or do you have any best practices that uh, you can comment on? Sure. 
I can answer that. Um, what we've seen is the industry is changing. Uh, we are seeing that you know, previously it was a big need to test on production. You build an app, it takes two, three months, and then you run a performance test, right? And whatever changes you get, you then go back into QA and make that whole complicated cycle. That still occurs, which is totally fine. But our recommendation is every time you write new code, every time you build something, every time you deploy, just run a quick performance test just to validate everything is going perfectly. Same thing for functional as well, as Don could probably add to, is why test all the way in the end when if you do have to make changes, that's just going to put a slower release cycle here. So might as well test at an earlier stage so that you can get that feedback and give it to the you know people that are going to make the changes going forward. Yeah, that's terrific. Uh, a number of people had, had questions about uh, compatibility of Lazmeter. So some folks had questions about the do support for uh, Microsoft Azure, and can you get uh, Microsoft uh, kind of stats from uh, using Lazmeter? Sure. So um, it, it doesn't matter where your uh, infrastructure is based. If it's an Azure, AWS, Google, that doesn't really matter to us. Uh, we can performance test at any infrastructure itself. Now, in terms of Azure, just know that when you can actually select a cloud test, we do support load coming from those locations, so that's an added benefit if you are already built on Azure infrastructure, where you can actually test from that specific location. Um, and I think there was another question, which I just forgot. So. Uh, it was, do you get uh, uh, the performance uh, metrics oh, yeah. back from Azure as well? And it really doesn't depend on what, on what platform people are running their, their, their apps on, right? I mean, you, like you said, you run with any, you work with anyone. Exactly, yeah. So specifically, um, if you're referring to the CloudWatch type of integration that uh, Azure might have, we can integrate, we can get that information from AWS. We are working on the Google and Azure cloud uh, statistics that you can get in terms of the server metrics and all of that information. But for now, we can actually support the AWS infrastructure. But again, it does not matter where your application is built or where it's hosted. We can still run the performance test going forward. Terrific. And someone else asked about the APM integration with the Blazemeter? Yep. So we actually, this was one of our main goals. Uh, we wanted to ensure, and the reason this is such a big thing, is that when you do our performance test, um, the APM integration just makes it better because you can figure out what within the application is breaking. Was it a database query call? Was it something relevant to the servers? So we do integrate with New Relic, Dynatrace, and AppDynamics. And the good thing is you can actually correlate those KPIs within BlazeMeter itself. So if you do run a performance test, you'll get the response times, hits, concurrency, and you can actually pull over your new relic and app dynamics and APM information over. Very nice. Yeah, I know people have, uh, we're asking questions about the uh, recording tool. Uh, I know there's uh, some recording, some playback and record tools for uh, functional testing. Uh, you have that nice uh, recording tool for uh, your app. Um, is the, does that also work for just a, like a single page, simple application, that, that, that specifically your recording tool? Uh, we're referring to the Blaze Meter recorder? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it can work on the single page. Um, I, I think there, I know there's another part of that question as well. It's probably the dynamic part of it. So they, you know, generate that dynamic data. Um, the recording that I did during the demo, demo today, just know that it's static. This means that, let's say I did put 450 users on that site. Not every user is going to Boston to New York, right? They might be doing different flights. So those changes, which we fully support, those are done through the open source tool themselves. So if, if you saw that I exported the JMeter script, you can open that in JMeter and make simple tweaks so that you get a dynamic, uh, dynamic scenario going forward. But yeah, we can fully, that recorder itself supports pretty much every application that has some sort of HTTP request or anything within that protocol. Yeah, I think there's a follow-on question here. It says, is it possible to record a script and somehow have the capability of generating dynamic data to avoid any caching? Yeah, so, so we're, we're getting to the point where we have something close. We don't, the, the Chrome recorder that you saw today will give you a static script, and it will basically get all that post information that's static, 
but just know that you can make changes if you wanted to, not through the recorder, but through JMeter or another tool if you like. Terrific. Hey, uh, Dom, there's a question here I think for you. Uh, I was talking about, someone's asking about the shifting, shifting left. Uh, do you have any recommendations around the frequency that those tests should be run? Is it practical to run performance tests with every build when I have several builds per day? So the, uh, the performance tests are going to be you know, more on the blaze meter side, but you know we definitely have customers that run functional tests and front end tests with not just every build, but with every pull request. So when you go to write some code, and uh, before you even go to integrate that code, uh, before you go to commit it, you run a pull request, and it you know updates your local database, and you run against your instance of the app with your change, with your change only, in order to see, you know, okay, is this, is this going to break anything? Here's a sanity test, and are we going to have an okay time when we go to integrate this code? Um, you know, other shops have larger or smaller integration and pull request tests, and it really depends on kind of what your testing matrix is, who your customers are, and the criticality of the, the code that you're pushing in. Yeah, I think that goes with uh, the you know the the more leading DevOps shops are you know doing uh, pushing code maybe 10, 12, 15 times a day, and they're running tests continuously. So I think it just depends upon your level of implementing both automated testing, both on the functional side and on the load side, and your integration with uh, uh, your CI servers. Absolutely, and we have you know, various organizations that will do kind of tiers of testing, right? So you'll have um, a small code acceptance, code acceptance test suite that, um, you know, if you've got tons of developers that are all pushing code, you need to have that code basically be tested as quickly as possible so that the integrations aren't holding up various parts of the code database while you're testing. So that testing needs to happen very, very, very quickly, and it needs to test just the things that you're touching. Um, once those things integrate, then you want to go back and have a more comprehensive test suite, like a regression test suite that might run nightly or a couple of times a day, and that will go back and test integrations. It will test how the code interacts with um, other parts of the application and things like that. Great, great input. Uh, yeah, we might add that uh, there's going to be a follow-on webinar to this one where uh, you guys are both going to get into more details about using a, a CI server and automating these uh, kinds of functional test performance tests uh, going forward in, in sometime in the next uh, month or two, right? Sid, uh, one question for you. I know you talked about the a lot of the focus here was on web apps. Uh, we had some questions about mobile apps. So does BlazeMeter support uh, uh, native mobile apps? Yeah, uh, we can do it. Uh, the way it's done is we actually have another recorder. But again, just know these recorders, they're static, so you do have to make some changes. But yeah, anything that's sending some sort of request from your mobile device, we can actually record that and deploy that into BlazeMeter itself. So. Uh, so a good way to get started is to use our mobile recorder, uh, which is within our app itself. Um, so if you have information, we can send that out. But, yeah, anything that's sending information from your app, we can record it. Then we can perform and test against it. All right, thanks. Well, you guys, we're, uh, we're at the top of the hour here, and, and most of the questions have, uh, I think we've answered. Uh, Sid and Don, thank you so much. That was very informative and, and great demos. I'd like to remind people that uh, the week after Labor Day, we're going to have the follow-on webinar where we'll get into more details about automating testing using your CI server with the functional tests and load testing. Again, I want to remind everyone that this session has been recorded, and once we get the slides and recording back and uh, put together, we'll be sending these out to you, and we hope that you will share these extensively with your colleagues and coworkers, many of which are probably in different time zones that won't be able to attend this, this session live. Again, Dom, thanks. thank you so much for your time, and this concludes our webinar today.